So thanks everyone for coming. So I'm Jonathan Weitzman. Um, it's now the it's the 18th seminar that we're running. So we <laughs> and we're back in confinement. We're back in lockdown for those of you who are in France. Um, so I sort of feel like we haven't <laughs> we haven't made much progress. Uh, but it's been fantastic to have these uh, these seminars um, every month. And um, I'm very very happy that um, Mike Stratton is with us today. So um, Mike was supposed to come for our annual meeting, which was supposed to have been on the 5th of February, and it was supposed to have been live, and he would have given the guest lecture. Um, just like last year, we had Sir Paul Nurse, and this year we were supposed to have Sir Mike Stratton. Um, but unfortunately, we had to cancel that, but Mike very, very kindly accepted to come back um, for, for the seminar series. I first met Mike um, at a meeting in <clears throat> the north of France, in Roscoff, a few years ago, we sat opposite each other at breakfast, and um, and he didn't tell me who he was. So we, we discussed <laughs> sequencing and cancer and all sorts of things, and then um, uh, very modestly. Uh, and then um, when the next day, when they presented the key keynote lecture, I realized that he was the head of the Welcome uh, Sanger Institute. So thank you very much, Mike, for coming, and um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and joining us today, uh, Louise is going to be the chairperson. And please come back uh, next month um, for this continuing series. Louise. So good evening. So today we are deeply honored to welcome Professor Mike Stratton, who is, um, among many other things, director of the Welcome Sanger Institute and chief executive officer of the Welcome Genome Campus. He also is a fellow of the Royal Society of London for the improvement of natural knowledge. And he was knighted by the Queen in 2013. The Welcome Sanger Institute was founded in 1992 to set up a large quail sequencing DNA during the Human Genome Project. But currently the Institute has extended its projects to many fields of science such as genetics of cancer, which is the main interest subject of Professor Stratton. In 2000, he initiated the Cancer Genome Project at the Welcome Sanger Institute. This initiative aims to decipher new mutation involved in cancer through state-of-the-art sequencing, and this leads to build a model of mutational processes and patterns of clonal evolution in human tumors. Professor Stratton is mainly known for identifying and sequencing the BRCA2 gene, which is a key gene for breast cancer. A series of other susceptibility genes have also been determined by Max Stratton and his team. And today he will talk about somatic mutation in normal human cells, the earliest stages of cancer development. So I will now give the floor to our guest, whom once again, we are very thankful to receive to our seminar series. Thank you very much, Louise, for that introduction. And thank you very much to you all for inviting me here this evening. I would have really loved to be with you in person in Paris, but um, unfortunately that can't be the case. So, but anyway, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you and discuss with you on Zoom. So, I'm going to talk to you today about somatic mutations in normal human cells, which enables us to look at the earliest stages of cancer development. So we have a, all of us more or less share a dogma that all cancers arise as a result of somatic mutations. In other words, mutations that <clears throat> occur in cells of our body throughout our lifetime. And because we believe that cancers arise due to these somatic mutations, more than 50,000 human cancer genomes have now been sequenced. And we do that in order to find the somatic mutations within those cancer genomes. And those mutations can be single nucleotide variants, single base substitutions, small insertions and deletions, structural changes, in other words, genomic rearrange re rearrangements or copy number changes. And once we have those sets of mutations from individual cancer genomes, we can make inferences from them. We can 
attempt to find the patterns of mutations, the mutational signatures, and speculate on the underlying biological processes that have caused those somatic mutations. We can analyze the data in different ways. We can look for driver mutations in cancer genes. Driver mutations are those mutations which can contribute to converting a normal cell into a cancer cell. And by definition, they are in cancer genes. We know, can also look at the data in different ways to find timing of mutations, and we can define lineages of cells. So those are all the inferences we can make from those catalogs of somatic mutations from cancer genomes. However, our knowledge of somatic mutations in normal cells is much more limited, and that is until recently. So why should it be so limited? And the reason is really technical and is down to the error rate of sequencing technologies, including standard Illumina next generation sequencing technology, because essentially every Illumina read contains one or two errors in it. And that makes life difficult for us because we need to distinguish between an error and a real somatic mutation. And in a cancer, that's relatively straightforward because a cancer cell population is a single clone of cells. And because of that, each cell shares a set of mutations. So if you find a uh, mutation at a particular point in the genome from a cancer, and then you sequence that same point in the genome again in an another DNA molecule, it will also have the same somatic mutation. So you build up that set of somatic mutations. It's you build up multiple reads with the same mutation in it. And that gives you the assurance that you're looking at a real mutation rather than an error. However, a normal cell population <clears throat> is composed of many, many myriad small clones, each with a different set of mutations in it. So if you find a particular read with one mutation, it's very unlikely that you're going to find that mutation again because you'll be sampling other clones which won't have it. And so that's the reason why we un have understood so little about somatic mutations in normal cells until recently. But you might ask, well, why worry about that? Why study somatic mutations in normal cells at all? And indeed, there are many reasons. Mutagenesis is a fundamental and ubiquitous biological process. It is, of course, the process that is the, uh, the substrate for evolution itself. So without mutations, none of us would be here. Life wouldn't have evolved. With respect to somatic mutations in human beings, these can inform on the earliest stages of cancer development. After all, all cancers come from normal cells. So at some point, a cancer was a normal cell, and it might be interesting to look at what that normal cell looked like and what the mutations were, the early mutations that converted that normal cell into a cancer cell. Somatic mutations may also causally contribute to other major um, biological processes in human beings, including aging. And there is a somatic mutation theory of aging, which just says that over life, we get more and more somatic mutations in all our cells in the body, and that causes those cells to function less well, and that's what aging is. So we can investigate that theory of aging by looking at somatic mutations in normal cells. And indeed, somatic mutations may causally contribute to other diseases than cancer. We don't know of too many of those at the moment, but it's a perfectly plausible hypothesis. Indeed, somatic mutagenesis in the body may be altered or caused by both exogenous or endogenous mutagenic exposures. So we can learn about those if we can look in normal tissues. It may be altered by inherited disease. There are um, a number of predispositions to disease, notably to cancer, that do cause an elevated mutation rate. And we can explore how that happens by looking at mu mutations in normal cells. And, in and indeed, non-inherited diseases, common diseases, can cause changes in the way cells divide and the experiences that cells have. And therefore, that can change the somatic mutations that are occurring within them. Indeed, there's a whole 
other area in which somatic mutations in normal cells can be interesting because cells that share somatic mutations almost certainly have a developmental origin. So if you find two cells that have got the same mutation in them, then that mutation must have occurred in a cell in the past. And those two cells that you're looking at are direct descendants of the, that cell. And that's already giving you information about the developmental origin of those two cells, a huge body of work to be done in that regard. So static, somatic mutations in normal cells, they are a permanent record. Mutations never disappear of the lifetime experiences of a cell. And we can recapitulate all those experiences by looking at the somatic mutations of normal cells. And when we do that, we're going to do exactly the same as we did for cancers. We're gonna find those four types of somatic mutation, and we're gonna draw exactly the same inferences from them, the mutational signatures and processes. We're gonna look whether there are driver mutations in normal cells and we can look at the timing of those mutations and we can look at lineages of cells. So given the, chat, the problems that I outlined of finding somatic mutations in normal cells, how do we go about doing it? Well, there are a number of ways that we can actually achieve it. The first is very simple. We can make clones of cells from normal tissues, grow up single cells into large numbers of cells and then just make DNA from them and sequence them in st by standard methods. Secondly, we could sequence to high depth random small biopsies that incorporate limited numbers of clones. And because we're sequencing to high depth, we can actually see the mutations that are present in those small clones within them. We can also sequence individual clonal structures in normal tissues. So cancer is a clonal structure, but there are actually clonal structures in normal tissues, and we can remove those by laser capture microdissection and sequence those. You could try sequencing normal cells, single normal cells, but the problem with that is that that technology is still under development and there are lots of artifacts, lots of errors, lots of bits of genomes that drop out as well. And so that, does, that makes it a not a very um, useful technology at the moment in doing this. And then there is a whole series of technologies that are just coming along called duplex sequencing, which allow you to sing, sequence actually single DNA molecules. And you use one DNA strand to confirm that a mutation that is present in the other DNA strand, we use that approach to get highly error corrected at duplex sequencing. So a number of different approaches can be used to look at finding somatic mutations in normal cells. But the one that I'm going to discuss today is to sequence individual clonal structures in normal tissues by cutting them out. So here I show uh, a mi uh, microscopy of the colon, and I'm going to talk mainly about the colon for the first part of the talk. And this is where the, uh, the lumen, the cavity of the colon is, and the colon is covered by a layer, layer of epithelial cells, and these dive down into the wall of the colon to form these glands, which are called crypts in the colon, and each crypt shown here is about 2,000 cells. So these crypts are formed by stem cells that are at the bottom of each crypt. And there's a small number of stem cells, five to 10 stem cells at the bottom of each colonic crypt that causes, that is responsible for the regeneration, continuous regeneration of that crypt. What actually transpires though, and here we see a crypt that's been cut across and each of uh, notional st seven stem cells here at the bottom of the crypt have been colored in different, in different colors, is that although there are seven stem cells in this um, notional crypt, actually one of them starts taking over the crypt over time. And so you can see here as the time progresses, that actually this crypt has dropped out and we now have two yellow crypts and two, sorry, two yellow stem cells and two blue stem cells. And then as time progresses further, we have three 
yellow stem cells, but now the blue stem cells seem to win out. There are no driver mutations, there's no selection, this is just genetic drift occurring naturally and continuously in a colon colonic crypt. And such that by the time we get here, all the stem cells in this colonic crypt are blue and they were derived from this cell here. And we can show that this happens in mice. So here you see um, mouse colon cut across. So these are transections of individual crypts and each colonic, each stem cell in the crypt has been labeled with a different color at a particular point in life, two weeks after birth, to a particular point in life. And what you see is that, for example, in this crypt here, some of the cells are yellow, some of the cells are blue. In this crypt here, some of the cells are red, some of the cells are blue. But if we wait another few weeks, all the cells in each crypt are the same color, exactly recapitulating what I showed you here. So in other words, if we sequence this crypt here, the mutations we get out will tell us about this cell, which may have existed a few weeks or a few months before. So to do this, it's a relatively simple thing. We take frozen biopsies from the colon in this case, we cut tissue sections, we look at them under the microscope, and then we will use a laser that I'll show you in a moment to cut out individual crypts, which are 200 to 2000 cells, and then we sequence those. And the only thing that we've had to do to implement this area of work is to make sequencing libraries from these relatively small numbers of cells, from 2000 cells. Um, and now we have that going in a way that we get as good sequences from 2000 cells as you might get from 200 million cells that you'd get from a piece of a cancer. So this again shows the, the wall of the colon with the crypts in there. And we can watch how we cut around. The laser is now cutting around an individual crypt. And in a few seconds, the static electricity will remove the crypt and put it in a micro in the well of a microtiter plate from where a library DNA will be made from it and the library for sequencing will be constructed and it will be sequenced. And using that technology, myself and my colleagues, we have been looking at somatic mutations in a number of human tissues, aiming ultimately to explore all human cell types and all human tissues. But the two that I'm going to tell you about today are large intestine and endometrium. So the study we've done in normal colon is to take colon samples from about 40 individuals across the age range of life. Some of these people had colonic cancer, others had a completely normal colon. We dissected to about 2,000 colon crypts, or Henry, Henry Lee Six, who was the student who did this work, did that. And from that, about 500 were whole genome sequenced, and the remainder were had targeting sequencing of about 90 cancer genes. We called somatic mutations in standard ways from these, and then we subjected those mutations to analysis of the numbers of mutations in a crypt, the mutational signatures, mutated cancer genes and cell lineages. So to look at that analysis, we first have to just review our classification of base substitution mutations. There are six types of base substitution. If we just start from the pyrimidine base of the uh, starting base pair, C to T, C to A, C to G, T to A, T to C, T to G. However, that classification is not good enough for most of the purposes that we want to use it. And we can elaborate it by looking at the DNA sequence around the mutated base. So here is a C to T mutation, but this one has got a T before the mutated C and a G after the mutated C. And this is another C to T mutation, this time with a A five prime to the mutated C. And here is another C to T mutation, this time with a C 
three prime to the mutated C. So since there are four possibilities, five prime and three and four possibilities, three prime, there are 16 subtypes of C to T mutation. And if we now apply that process to all six of the base substitutions, we end up with 96 mutation classes, 96 types of base substitution mutations defined by the mutation itself and by the sequence context around it. And this is the classification we use to analyze um, base substitutions and their consequences. So when we look at the mutation spectrum now of an individual normal colon crypt, so this is data just from one crypt, from one person. First of all, we can see the number of mutations. So there are about 4,500 base substitutions in this colon crypt. That's telling us about a single cell that, from which that colon crypt was derived. So really for the first time there, we are seeing actual mutation loads in individual human cells. And so in the colonic stem cell, colonic crypt stem cell that generated this crypt, there were 5,000 base substitutions. And you can see that they are, there are particular subtypes of base substitution in this crypt. Most of the mutations are these red C to T mutations and they're occurring particularly at four sequence contexts. So this is the spectrum of one, mutation spectrum of one individual normal colorectal crypt. So that's, if that's one crypt, we can look at four crypts from four different individuals. And you can see that the number of mutations in them is different, and we'll come back in a moment to why that is. It's a very simple answer. But the second thing you can see is that the patterns of mutations in these colorectal crypts from different people are very similar indeed. Most colorectal crypts look pretty much identical in terms of their mutation spectra, the types of somatic mutations that are in them. So now we can start to do some analyses of these data. And the first thing we can look at is how many mutations are there in individual colon crypts relating to the age of the individual. And that's shown here. Each of these colored bars and dots represents data from one individual. So this brown uh, dot is the one in, and bar is from one individual and this is another individual. And you can see their ages and the num total number of base substitutions per crypt on the vertical axis. And you can see very clearly that there is a more or less linear acquisition of mutations throughout the lifespan. So what that is telling us is that the mutation rate throughout life is constant. And because we're looking at data here from multiple different people, about 40 people, the mutation rate is pretty much similar in all of us and in all of our colorectal crypts pretty much similar, but not identical, because you can see that there are two individuals, this one here and this one here, that seem to have higher mutation rates in their colorectal crypts. And we'll come back to those individuals in a moment. But in general, the number, we all accumulate mutations in this more or less completely linear fashion throughout life in our normal cells and particularly shown here in our colorectal crypts. So I already showed you this slide. Here are the four crypts from four different individuals and they looked pretty similar to each other, but they don't all look as similar. So here's another crypt from um, another individual and you can see that this one does look different. There are things going on here that are not present in these four. And here is another crypt which has also got something different. It's different from this and it's different from all of these with these gray T2A mutations. And here is some, another crypt that's looking different with something subtle going on in the black C to G mutations. And here is another crypt from another person where again, there are other things going on compared to what you see here. So although most colon crypts and therefore colon cells have a very similar pattern of mutations as shown here, some do differ. So what is going on with these? 
Well, in order to understand that, we need to introduce the concept of mutational signatures, which are patterns of mutations, and the underlying mutational processes. So as we've been discussing during the course of a lifetime, all cells acquire somatic mutations. We now believe that there are multiple mutational processes that can generate somatic mutations in human beings. And those mutational processes can operate as part of normal and abnormal cell biology. And they will, each mutational process will have a component which will be DNA damage or modification that can be um, further modified by DNA repair and can be with final generation of mutations through DNA replication. So each mutational process has a component of damage, repair and replication. And each mutational process leaves a distinct signature of somatic mutations on the genome, a pattern. It now turns out that actually most individual cells have experienced multiple mutational processes. So the mutations that each of those processes have generated are now jumbled up together in individual cells. Nevertheless, we can extract out, we can separate those patterns that have been jumbled up using mathematical uh, approaches. And then having extracted the mutational signatures, so extracted the patterns that have been mixed up together, we can then estimate the contribution of each mutational signature to each cancer or each normal genome. So in past work that we did on cancers, we analyzed about 24,000 cancers of most cancer types. So that's 24,000 mutation catalogs, which was about 84 million somatic mutations. And we applied a mathematical approach that allows us to separate those mutational signatures that have been jumbled up together, in this case in cancer cells. So we separate them, we extract them, and we then define a reference set of mutational signatures. And that's shown here. So in the top set of panels, there are 49 different single base substitution mutational signatures. And then we can do that for other types of mutation, doublet base substitution, where you've got two base substitutions next to each other and for indels. But we're not gonna talk about those today. We're just going to restrict ourselves to single base substitution mutational signatures. There were 49 when I made this slide, there are about 60. So this gives you a sense of the number of mutational processes that are operative in human cancers and indeed in human normal cells. There are about 60 of them. So 60 mutational signatures, that means 60 underlying biological mutational processes operative. Now in the colon, in the normal colon, we were able to find nine of those mutational signatures. Five of those were already known, so they would have been seen on this previous slide somewhere amongst this set of reference signatures that you see here. And four were novel. Three of those signatures were ubiquitous, by which I mean they were found in every person that we looked in and in every crypt that we looked in. So every cell that we looked at had those mutational signatures within them. But six of them were sporadic. In other words, either they were present only in some people or they were present only in some crypts. In other words, only in some cells. So these are the ubiquitous mutational signatures, which you'll see presented now in this familiar uh, depiction. So this is signature one, single base substitution signature one, which is, as you can see, um, predominantly characterized by red C to T mutations. And there are these particular four sequence contexts. And this is a very familiar mutational process that's been known about for many, many years, which is caused by deamination of methylated cytosine causing C to T mutations at CPG dinucleotides. So that's one of those ubiquitous mutational signatures that's found in everybody and in every cell. Signature five 
single base substitution signature five is has a very different profile as you can see while signature one is constrained to just four really of the 96 different uh, subtypes of base substitution signature five is a very flat signature rather featureless signature this one is also this one is unknown the, the cause of it it's likely to be produced be produced by polymerase errors of some sort or another but actually we don't really know what the cause of it is which is remarkable actually because this signature five is probably the most common cause of mut somatic mutations but it's also the most common cause of mutations in the germ line so most of the human variation that is between all of us is caused by this mutational the process underlying this mutational signature and the cause of it is essentially unknown and the final ubiquitous mutational signature found in colon is this signature 18 which is characterized predominantly by these blue c2a mutations and we believe this is likely to be due to reactive oxygen species all cells undergo metabolism they produce um, these reactions these processed oxygen which can bind to dna and damage it and when they damage dna they produce these mutations so these are the ubiquitous mutational signatures i've already shown you this slide which is the total number of mutations and how they relate to age but we can do the same for the number of mutations that are present in of all these ubiquitous mutational signatures and you can see that signature one accumulates with age signature five accumulates with age and signature 18 also accumulates with age all of them in a linear fashion meaning that it's pretty much constant over life and all three of them have more or less similar mutation rates in all of us. So those are the, those are the um, ubiquitous signatures, but I showed you already some of these signatures that are sporadic. And those are shown here. We'll focus for a moment on this signature A, which has a very different profile to the ones we've been seeing thus far. We will just convince you that signature A does contribute to the mutations present in individual crypts. So here is a crypt from one person that is showing the very standard pattern of mutations. But this is a different crypt from the same person where you can see that superimposed upon that standard pattern is that additional mutational signature of signature A. So one of the things we can do is we can actually ask when did that signature A affect that, uh, that cell? And we can do that by making phylogenetic trees of cells. So here is a phylogenetic tree that we can build from mutations that have come from three crypts. Where the mutations in crypt A are private, these are the mutations that are private to crypt A, and these are mutations that are private to crypt B. But if crypt A and B came from a common progenitor cell that was the mutations that were present in that progenitor cell will be shared between crypt A and B and those mutations must have occurred earlier than these mutations. So where we see mutations that are shared by two crypts those must be early and where we see mutations that are private to crypts they must be late. So that allows us to time mutations. And this is a phylogenetic tree from all the crypts, colon, crypts that we analyzed from one individual. And the length of these bars is the number of base substitutions, the number of mutations in each crypt, and the colors show the mutational signatures that have contributed in terms of the proportion of mutations. And the mutational signature that we're interested in is this pink mutational signature, which is that SBSA, that sporadic mutational process. And we can see that it's sporadic because there are some crypts that have got a lot of it, and there are some crypts that don't seem to have any of it. That's what makes it sporadic. But the interesting crypts are these ones here, because these ones are forming a phylogenetic tree. So these mutations here are common to all four of these crypts. These, these mutations here are just common to these two crypts. And what you can see is that most of the pink, in other words, the signature A, are present in these very early parts of the phylogeny, but they're not present late. And so these mutations 
the signature A mutations occurred early in life. Despite the fact that we're looking in, at an individual here in their 60s, we can infer that these particular mutations found here and here occurred during childhood. So this signature is relatively common. It's usually just present in a subset of crypts, it's sporadic. The affected crypts tend to be close to each other as if something from the contents of the bowel are affecting them. They cause both base substitutions and indels. There is evidence that they're causing damage on adenine and they're predominantly operative during this signature is op op operative during childhood. So what we'd really like to know is what is causing it? What is causing this exposure during childhood that we're seeing in crypts? And the answer to that came very quickly after we published the original observation, not from our lab, but from the lab Hans Clevers in Utrecht. And what Hans was doing was that he was subjecting colorectal organoids. He was growing them together with bugs from the microbiome, particularly E. coli bugs and particularly E. coli that have got a particular synthetic pathway that makes a, a mutagen that is called colibactin. So he grew these cells in culture, he grew them together with the bugs, and then he sequenced the cells. And when he sequenced them, this is what he found. This is the mutational signature that he found. And you can see it's a basically a dead ringer from what we had found in colon crypts from people. So similar that we can make the conclusion we can, that basically the signature A is caused by colibactin in human beings being produced by E. coli in the microbiome. So the microbiome is producing this chemical that is mutagenizing the colon and it's doing it during early childhood. I think I'll leave that because that may go. So that's one of the mutational, sporadic mutational signatures. But here is another one. This one characterized by these gray mutations. And this had a rather different pattern. This was only found in one person was found in all their crypts from the right transverse and left colon and it also had evidence of damage to adenine. There was no mystery about why this mutational signature was present in the normal colorectal cells of this individual. This individual it turned out was this person here who had an elevated mutation rate right across their colon and the reason for that was because this person had had cancer and had had multiple rounds of chemotherapy. And it was those multiple rounds of chemotherapy that were causing that mutational signature and were causing that elevated mutation rate. But the remarkable thing about this and what this person, this individual is telling us is that we can tolerate very large numbers of mutations in our cells because this person had something like three to four times the number of mutations in his colon cells that he should have done. He was about 70 when he was sampled. Therefore, if we were to give him a mutational age, he was about 250 years old, according to the number of mutations that he had in his colon. But nevertheless, his colon was normal and the rest of him was normal too. We can tolerate huge numbers of mutations in our cells without much going wrong. So then, so those are the mutational processes. We can also talk about driver mutations now in normal colon cells. So we can take the data that we have generated and we can look for driver mutations in two ways. We can first do statistical tests which say that particular genes have got mutations more commonly than other genes. Or we can just look through the set of genes that are mutated because we now have a, a pretty good set of about 800 cancer genes from sequencing 50,000 cancer genomes and look for the mutations that we know convert those, uh, those cancer genes, allow those cancer genes to convert a normal cell into a cancer cell. So that's the way that we harvested the driver mutations in normal 
colonic crypts. And to perhaps our surprise, what we found was about 1% of normal crypts in a 60 year old individual carry a driver mutation. Remember a driver mutation is something you find in a cancer. So how come we're finding it in normal cells and in normal crypts? Well, the answer is that these are basically benign neoplasms, benign tumors. They're benign tumors that look absolutely normal, but because they have a driver mutation in them, they are benign neoplasms. And that driver mutation is causing the cells with the driver mutation to take over individual crypts. So if there are 15 million crypts in a colon, which is what there are, there are about 150,000 normal crypts that carry a driver mutation in the normal colon of a 60 year old individual. So if there are 150,000 crypts carrying a driver, that means there are 150,000 benign tumors, benign neoplasms, tiny neoplasms in a in the normal colon. So that is rather thought provoking because 40% of individuals about 70 years of age or more have an adenoma on colonoscopy. So that means that only about one in 400,000 of those normal crypts with drivers becomes a, a macroscopically visible adenoma. We have these 150,000 benign neoplasms which are microscopic and look normal, but only about one in 400,000 of those ever becomes an adenoma, a visible tumor. And since about 5% of people develop colorectal cancer over their lifetime, only about one in three million normal crypts with driver mutations becomes a cancer. So we've got this amazing pyramid that leads to a cancer. A cancer is an incredibly rare event. Even if one has a driver mutation within a cell, a driver mutation which can contribute to the development of cancer, a trivial proportion of cells with such drivers ever become cancers. So I'll switch in my last few minutes to endometrium. And endometrium is a uniquely dynamic tissue, rather different from colon, which is why we wanted to study it and contrast it with colon. It has a stromal layer shown here, which is invaginated by glands, which come down from the surface of the endometrium and they dive deep into the stroma and into the wall of the uterus. And of course, the endometrium goes through multiple different physiological states through life, before menarche, then through menstrual cycling, then in pregnancy, and then post-menopause. And during that period of re reproduction and of um, menstrual cycling, there is cyclical breakdown, there is shedding of that endometrium, and then repair of that interrupted um, glandular sheet by stem cells from within the basal glands that are retained after menstruation. So a very dynamic tissue. So we did the same thing here that we did for colon. We took normal endometrial samples, this time from 28 individuals across the age range. We dissected endometrial glands, we whole genome sequenced them, we called somatic mutations, and we did the analysis that we did for colon. And we could find similar things. These are the total numbers of, of mutations that we find by age, and we see that there's a linear acquisition of base substitution mutations. So women, all the, the mutation rate is linear in the endometrium, and the mutation rate is similar in different people. And we can look at the mutational signatures that are present, and it's the same set of ubiquitous mutational signatures, signature one, signature five, and signature 18. And as we saw in the colon, there is a linear acquisition of these three mutational signatures too. So they're all ticking over, generating mutations in the endometrium as in the colon at particular rates that are present uh, throughout life and in all women. There is, however, a difference between colon and endometrium, which is actually the mutation rate. The mutation rate in the colon is higher than in endometrium. So the spectra are rather similar, but nevertheless, the rates are different. And in fact, that's, we can generalize to that 
different cell types, different tissues have different mutation rates. And the reason for that is because they have different rates of each of those three ubiquitous signatures, the signature one, signature five, and signature 80. So there are different mutation rates in different cell types. But the really interesting thing about the endometrium is what happens when you look for driver mutations. Because we found driver mutations in normal endometrium glands from almost all the women. In fact, many endometrial glands carry driver mutations. So about 60% of glands had at least one driver, but then we were very surprised to see that quite a high proportion had two drivers, had two driver mutations, and a small proportion had at least four. Now, when we are used to in our past looking at um, genomes, and if we see four driver mutations, we would assume that that must be a cancer with four cancer driving mutations, but we're not looking at cancers here. We're looking at normal endometrial cells. Indeed, in four out of the 28 women we looked at, all the glands we analyzed carry driver mutations through in, these, in women of these ages. So the whole endometrium was one big set of neoplasms. It was all neoplastic with multiple of these neoplasms. So we can draw a phylogenetic tree here on its side for uh, endometrial glands, like I showed you for the colonic crypts previously. And we can put the driver mutations on these um, trees in the way that we show, I showed you previously for the mutational signatures. So that's what these are. These are driver mutations in cancer genes. And then we can look at some of these and we can follow the way that these basically these small tumors within the endometrium developed. So we're going to look at these three glands here on the tree. And we start here. This is a gland here that was cut out. And this has got two absolutely canonical driver mutations in HRAS and then this Argat35 cancer gene. So this one had two mut driver mutations. But if we move to this gland here, it's got the same two HRAS and ARPGAP35 mutations, but by the time we get to this gland, the tumor has acquired a third driver mutation in BRAF, a tumor I call it, it's benign tumor, but this is normal endometrium. And then when we get to this gland, we've got those three drivers plus a fourth one, this PIK3R1. So we can see how these, this benign neoplasm has colonized the whole endometrium. What we can also do is time when these mutations occur. So this is the tree from a 60 year old individual. You can see that these two drivers are on this very early part of the tree. And indeed this whole clone with these, these drivers arose during the first decade of life. So we're looking at a 60 samples from a 60 year old individual, but we're inferring now that these driver mutations and this clonal development, this benign neoplasm started before the age of 10 in this person. And in fact, many of these normal endometrial neoplastic clones arise in the first decade of life. So we now have this extraordinary concept that if endometrial cancers arise from these normal neoplastic clones, which they probably do because it's exactly the same sets of cancer genes that we see in endometrial cancers, then cancers that arise in individuals and endometrial cancer tends to arise at the age of 70, 70 to 80, that that cancer has been developing, has been evolving for almost the whole lifetime of that person's life and acquired its first driver mutation before the age of 10 and was evolving throughout the lifetime of that person before ultimately manifesting at the age of 70. So we've got a, something that we need to consider here. We now know that driver mutations are found in normal cells, and these are microscopic, morphologically normal, but benign neoplasms. 
but they differ in frequency between cell types and tissues. In the colon, we found 1% of crypts with drivers in a 60-year-old, but in endometrium, it was basically 100% of their glands had drivers in 60-year-olds. Why should that be? Well, it's not because of the mutation rate, because of what I showed you earlier, the colon has a higher mutation rate than, than, than the endometrium. So what we speculate is that it's to do with the normal physiology of the endometrium, because the endometrial epithelium is shed every month. And so every month, stem cells that are left behind have to recolonize the surface of the endometrium. And there is then a competition every month between stem cells which have a driver mutation and therefore have a bit of a selective advantage and stem cells that don't have a driver mutation. So they don't have that selective advantage. And that race that occurs every month as the endometrium is shed iteratively month by month means that the stem cells which have driver mutations ultimately colonize the whole endometrium. But it still looks entirely normal. So I'll now summarize. We can now um, extract some generalities about the somatic mutations of normal cells just from looking at these two cell types. That there are ubiquitous mutational processes, signatures 1, signatures 5, and also signature 18 in most cell types, that generate mutations at a more or less constant rate over a lifetime, and that's pretty much the same in everybody. But the mutation rates of these ubiquitous processes differ between cell types. And there are also sporadic mutational processes, which can be of endogenous or exogenous origins, which are present only in some people, only in some cell types, and only in some, or, and or only in some cells. So that's the picture of mutagenesis that we are now getting in the normal cells of the body. And when it comes to driver mutations that are in cancer genes in normal cells, driver mutations are certainly found in normal cells. So these are microscopic, morphologically normal, benign neoplasms, benign tumors. These microscopic neoplasms differ in frequency between cell types and between tissues, with endometrium with a huge number, with colon with many fewer. Different cancer genes and with different driver mutations are operative in different cell types. We've seen that those driver mutations in normal cells can arise really early in life. And that although we all have huge numbers of these morphologically normal benign neoplasms with drivers, only a very trivial proportion of them ever become um, morphologically manifest macroscopically, either as adenomas or as carcinomas. So the two students who did this work were Henry Lee Six, who did all the work on the colon, and Louisa Moore, who did all the work on the endometrium. There were many collaborators with, working with us on the colon and on the endometrium. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and coming here this evening. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this really interesting talk. So now I will start to read the question. So there is one from Jonathan who says, uh, signature A is equally generated. Are there signature related to specific diets? The diet. Did you say diet? Yes. Yeah. Um, we, we don't know that actually yet. If there are signatures relating to diet, I mean, it could be the case. Uh, they're going to be subtle. So that could be a specific signature associated with a particular dietary component, but it would be contributing relatively small numbers of mutations because we're not seeing it very obviously. Or the diet could be influencing the mutation rate of those ubiquitous signatures, signatures 1, 5, and 18. Um, we, we don't know that that, that is happening, um, but we would need very large numbers of crypts from large numbers of individuals who had very well characterized diets in order to do that study. And it's a worthwhile study to think about, but um, we haven't done that study. Okay. 
Um, thank you. Another question from Jonathan. Have you done the same experiment with ancient DNA samples? And um, what did you learn? We haven't done it with ancient DNA samples um, because ancient DNA would not be preserved well enough for us to um, you know, dissect out these very, very small things like crypts or glands and then get enough DNA that was intact to sequence them. So technically, technically that's not possible at the moment. Okay. Um, another question from Gael. Um, thank you for this great talk. How do you manage to sequence um, genomic DNAs from 2,000 sorry, cells? Do you use a single cell strategy? Not really. It's um, it is the the the, the um, technique that has been published, and it's really just a, um, an um, elaboration of the standard Illumina pipeline, with some additional um, <clears throat> some additional rounds of um, amplification during the course of making the library, and then having done that. Um, some additional informatic filters to get rid of the artifacts that are generated. So it's relatively simple, as I say, uh, adaptations of the of the standard Lumina technology for making the library. It took us a reasonable, the person doing it, a reasonable amount of time to just get it absolutely right so that the artifact rate comes right down. And as I said during the talk, the standard of quality of the genome that we get using this um, technology is as good as getting it from you know very large amounts of dna but the the protocol has been published okay um also you said that um a cell can support a, a large amount of mutation before getting um malign um could it be uh, imaginable that one only mutation can uh, can drive the cell, or have we never seen it? Um, well, I think there are a couple of questions in there. I mean, the what you say is correct. Um, as I said, we can tolerate huge numbers of mutations. And um, what I showed that the person had chemotherapy was not as high as we've seen. We've seen people who have 30 times the numbers of mutations. So their mutational age was in the hundreds and yet they looked completely normal so we we as people we as human beings we as organisms can tolerate incredibly high mutation loads can a single set single driver mutation i think is your question um confer selective advantage well what we're seeing in everything i've shown you is that a single driver mutation can confer selective advantage on a cell so it grows better than cells that don't have that driver but it's a limited effect they you know they just take over a gland better than a stem cell without a driver but they look completely normal and so one driver probably cannot take you to a cancer or in, or it's incredibly rare for that to happen and as I showed you there, we had normal cells that had four drivers in them and they were still behaving absolutely normally. So it takes multiple drivers to become a cancer. And that's presumably our protection against getting cancer, which is that to get there, it's a very rare event because there are so many hurdles that need to be overcome. So many driver mutations that need to be acquired in a single cell before it starts behaving as a cancer. Okay, thank you. Um, Lisa asks, uh, have you looked at metastases? Do their mutational signature differ from primary tumors? Um, they can do. Um, they, will, uh, they will have the mutational signature since they're derived from a primary tumor. They will have the mutational signatures that were present in the primary tumor. But they can acquire additional signatures um, as they seed and grow out as metastases. Yeah, so there are certain signatures that um, can occur relatively late in, in tumor development as part of that um, sort of branching lineage of, of 
cancer development. Um, for example, there's a set of signatures that are caused by Apobec enzymes. These are DNA editing enzymes. Uh, they're quite common signatures found in human cancer and they can occur quite late and you can find metastases that have the Apobec signatures in them, but the primary tumor that doesn't have it. Okay. Um, Felix then asks, um, you said that the causes of mutation SBS5 are unknown, but are there some leads of what it could be? Um, <laughs> well, th there's nothing more than, than speculation at the moment um, that it's some form of error that polymerases make. However, um, when we talk in that way, what we usually are, well, what I'm usually thinking about is that these mutations occur when cells divide. So cells divide, DNA needs to be replicated, very dangerous time for DNA, replicating 3000 million base pairs of DNA, mistakes must get made. And that's what I have in my mind. And that's where I would have said that that's what signature five is, mistakes being made by polymerases and replicating DNA during mitosis. But there is work that is going to be published in the next couple of months or so from um, my colleague um, Inigo Martin Carena at Sanger, who has been using a different technology to find um, somatic mutations, a new technology, which he can apply to cells that never divide or don't divide after embryogenesis, so nerve cells. And he has applied it to nerve cells and nerve cells actually have a reasonably high mutation rate, similar to that of endometrium. And it's all, almost all that signature five. So since nerve cells don't divide, that signature five is presumably being generated not during mitosis, not during DNA replication at mitosis, but through some other rather mysterious process that's occurring in G0 or G1. Yeah, very surprising. This, this is really interesting. Um, Jonathan uh, says that there is a question from his son. Uh, can we still call them drivers if they don't cause cancers? Why don't they, why do they not drive to tumors? They are, they are like slow Sunday's drivers. <laughs> Sunday drivers, yeah. Um, well, we can call them drivers because um, they do cause selective advantage to the cells. So the cells with a driver, that's how we identify them. So they, they can cause some selective advantage to a cell and make a cell with a driver grow better than a cell without a driver. Why don't they cause cancer? Because you probably need, because cancer is a very, very um, disordered um, state of a cell and a single driver just cannot convert a normal cell into a cancer. You need multiple drivers that have subverted multiple biological pathways before a cell becomes a fully fledged cancer cell. So that is, I think, the most standard, I think, um, explanation for why you need multiple drivers. The finding of drivers, but the, the question is a good one because the finding of drivers in normal cells actually has made us and others question whether actually when you find those drivers in a cancer, are they actually contributing to the cancer? And because if they're present in normal cells, then you know the occasional cancer will just pick one up by, by chance. But the, re the way that we know that they are contributing to the cancers is because of course, many of these, driver, these cancer genes with driver mutations or at least their proteins have been targeted by anti-cancer drugs. 
So the BRAF gene, for example, of which I showed you mutations in normal endometrium, you know, the, the once, once um, that's a kinase, and so a ki anti-kinase drug was developed against it, and that drug works in malignant melanomas, which have BRAF mutations. It will basically send a put a malignant melanoma that is metastatic in somebody basically into complete remission, at least temporarily. So cancers clearly are dependent on these drivers. We, can, we are essentially doing that experiment in human beings using those sorts of drugs. Thank you. Um, Sergio then asks, um, what do you think that you still keep a linear cor correlation when you see sporadic signatures? Are these sporadic signatures associated with the age? Is there an average age associated with the starting point for sporadic signatures? Um, well, the sporadic signatures tend, well, they tend not to be linearly correlated with age. Um, the the, um, the colibactin signature that I showed you, you know, it occurs in childhood. So, and it stops after that. In fact, it is possible, we wonder, we speculate that the colibactin signature is caused immediately after birth when the microbiome starts to colonize the child's colon because the colon at birth is sterile but then immediately the bugs usually from the mother start to colonize the child and whether it's at that moment that bugs containing that are making the colibactin secrete it and it causes the mut mutations that we find in the colon and that once that happens, that initial shock has been absorbed, the colon puts up a barrier that no longer allows those bugs, no longer allows the colibactin to get at the, to get at the stem cells. So in signatures of that nature, they don't linearly accu accumulate through life because they just happen immediately after birth or in childhood and then they stop. Okay, um, then um, Miley's says, you mentioned that the colon cells uh, from the individual with a lot of mutation were not malignant. However, on the, si on the slide, it was written that this, personal, uh, that this person sorry, had colorectal cancer. So can cells really have high number of mutation without becoming cancerous? Yeah, so that's um, a reasonable question. And the answer is both, well, the answer is both yes and no. Um, we have looked in people who have got um, defects in DNA repair and those defects, inherited defects of DNA repair. Um, that cause, and what we find is that then these defects in DNA repair, are in, these syndromes are characterized by the presence that they develop colorectal adenomas and colorectal cancer. When we looked at these individuals, we found that every cell, every crypt and every cell in their colon has got an elevated mutation rate. Some of them with huge mutation rates. These people do develop colorectal adenomas and they do develop colorectal cancer. So in that sense, having a high mutation rate does give you cancer. But still, the vast majority of cells on of colon, colonic cells and colonic crypts in those people are normal, despite the fact that they all have this high mutation rate. So a high mutation rate gives you a higher risk of getting colorectal cancer. But even so, it's a trivial, a tiny, tiny proportion. One in 15 million, two in 15 million cells actually ever make it to become a cancer, despite that elevated mutation rate. 
thank you, Professor Stratton, for this really interesting talk. We all learned a lot today. And thanks to everyone um, for your presence and participation to this seminar series. We were really pleased to meet you all. You will have the possibility to watch this seminar again on the Urgin website and the YouTube channel. Uh, this video will be available in the coming day. And uh, we wish you all a great evening and we are looking forward to see you next month. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.